Uh, good morning or good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Um, while people are joining us, I'm just going to go through a little bit of housekeeping. We do have a lot of material to cover today, so I'm going to keep introductions and uh, basic information pretty short. Um, everyone is on mute right now except for the panelists. So we will be taking questions at the end of the, of the presentation. We might end up going over an hour, but we will be taking questions at the end. You can submit a question at any point during the presentation by typing it into the chat window on the GoToWebinar box. Uh, if you don't see the question box, you might need to click the little orange arrow that's on the top right of your screen, and then the chat box will appear. So uh, go ahead and enter those questions anytime you think of them, and we'll take them at the end of the presentation. We'll also be recording the webinar, so if you uh, need to drop off, or if you want to access the information later, or pass it on to someone else, uh, we will have a recording of the webinar available. We'll probably have the webinar up uh, on our website tomorrow sometime. So um, just I'm going to go very briefly through what SSTI is. Uh, I urge you to go to our website SSTI.us if you would like more information. Uh, we are housed at the University of Wisconsin and we work with reform-minded DOTs across the country. We have meetings with them and work with them as a community of practice. We also do technical assistance and we are a resource to the larger transportation community and that's where our webinars come in. Today, we will be joined by four speakers. Um, Beth Osborne, we'll first be hearing from Beth. She's the Senior Policy Advisor from Smart Growth America. She previously worked at USDOT, where she managed the Tiger Discretionary Grant Program and the Secretary's Livability Initiative and the development of the Administration's Surface Transportation Authorization Proposal. Before she joined USDOT, Beth worked for a number of U.S. representatives as legislative aide and legislative director. Uh, we'll next be hearing from Kevin Marsha. He is the Chief Engineer and Director of the Highway Division at the Vermont Agency of Transportation. He's also on the board, he's also the board chair of the Vermont Highway Safety Alliance. After that, we'll be hearing from Billy Hadaway, who is the District 1 Secretary at the Florida De Department of Transportation. He was also honored as the 2014 Governing Magazine Public Official of the Year for his work to improve pedestrian safety in Florida. Uh, he's doing great work there. Finally, we'll be hearing from Roger Millar, who is the Deputy, Deputy Secretary at the Washington Department of Transportation. And he has a very long resume, which I am not going to read, but he has, has worked for cities all across the West. He's done private consulting. He was the Vice President of Smart Growth America. And while at SGA, he was responsible for working with states on the M2D2 technical assistance approach, uh, which we'll be hearing about today. So uh, I'm sorry if I gave everybody short shrift, but I want to get right into the presentations. So I am going to give control of the keyboard and the presentation to Beth, and she can take it from there. Unmute me. Unmute me for a minute. Thank you for uh, for joining the conference today and for uh, giving us a chance to talk about something I'm really excited about. Um, I'm going to start off by just giving you a little overview about what M2D2 is. Uh, as you can see, it stands for Multimodal Development and Delivery, but it sounds much more Star Wars if we call it M2D2. Um, I am having trouble getting... Sorry. To Okay, thank you, Robbie. Um, so what is M2D2? Uh, M2D2 is a technical assistance program that looks at ways to plan, design, construct, operate, and maintain a transportation network that works for all modes. It is delivered in a series Muted. of workshops that helps identify the rules and documents and procedures and culture and expectations and everything that can lead 
to the accommodation of all travelers or more likely that is currently leading to the exclusion of some of those travelers. Uh, oops. Why M2D2? Well, this came up while Roger was still at Smart Growth America and he was working with the folks in Michigan DOT. Uh, they were uh, trying to bring complete streets approaches into their system. A lot of communities have adopted complete streets policies, but they've been frustrated to find out that even after you adopt the policy, it doesn't automatically change all of the, the rules and guidances and procedures and things that lead to an incomplete street approach. And so M2D2 was formed um, through our work with uh, initially Michigan to figure out what were those barriers for bringing a complete streets and multimodal approach all the way through the project development system, project selection system, um, uh, construction and operation. Our workshops are, it's a series of workshops because it's a ton of information that cover issues from integrating land use and transportation to active transportation and considering the needs of the bike, uh, bicyclists, pedestrians, transit user, users, also the freight users of the system, um, and the use of intelligent transportation services and TDM approaches. And it all concludes in looking at how you deal with the various trade-offs and integration between all of those users and your current procedures. SGA then provides a report that uh, identifies the various hurdles that uh, we would have discussed with the, the state DOT and different changes that needs to be made. And what we're going to talk about today is some examples of that in Florida and Vermont and what they're doing going forward with this information. So uh, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Kevin. You're going to hear from Kevin, Billy, and Roger. Kevin and Billy are, are moving into implementation of removing these barriers, and Roger is starting to develop his own list. Unmuted. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Kevin Marshy from Vermont. Unmuted. Uh, a little bit about the process that we have ongoing in Vermont. Uh, before I start, just to give a little bit of history, um, we're talking about our Vermont state standards. Uh, these standards were flexible standards that we instituted back in 1997 uh, due to some legislation, some issues we had here in Vermont. And at the time, we're kind of on the, uh, the cutting edge, if you will, of looking at flexibility in, in design and as it related to all users. And over the course of, uh, you know, 15 years or so, I actually kind of fell behind uh, the rest of the country. So we identified back in trying to get the slides to go here. Um, we identified uh, several years ago with some work with Smart Growth America that we needed to take on a, a project to update our state standards. And really the, the purpose of that project was to update and make sure that we were keeping pace nationally with the state of the practice um, in highway engineering. And not just engineering, but design considerations and, and looking at all the modes and, and those things that you need to consider and must consider uh, when you're looking at uh, different solutions to employ on the highway network. And then uh, we also wanted to make sure that we were meeting our customer needs, our community needs, and that maybe we, uh, we had outgrown uh, the Vermont State standards over the course of those 15 years or so. The purpose of the Vermont State standards uh, is, is very clear, and this is what, uh, what we set forth uh, back when we did, did them initially in 97, was to provide clear direction uh, to designers of transportation projects in Vermont. And, and I will say that that's, that is very clear, um, but we've actually expanded that through this process, and I'll touch on that a little bit more to, to get beyond just the designers of transportation projects. And then, of course, uh, something that we all think about is, you know, the accessibility, the mobility, and, and, and of course, the safety for all users. But something that uh, we're really keen on here in Vermont, and I know other states are as well, is making sure that we, we, d we implement solutions that fit into the context of our rural environment, or all environments, especially our rural environments, our rural villages. So one of the things that we did, and I mentioned earlier, uh, that, that our legislature um, actually in 97 through rulemaking instituted our state standards and one of the things that we did back in 2014 is we worked with our legislature to actually provide us some guidance uh, in, in our transportation bill that they passed to institute this project um, and make sure that it was well known and recognized that it came all the way from our legislature, our governor's office and, and all the way through our organization. 
and and again, I'm not going to read slide by slide, but you know, it was a the the purpose was a multidisciplinary uh, approach that included our partners, not just those folks that worked at the Agency of Transportation, but we wanted to make sure that our private sector um, for, uh, interest groups and, and other agencies within state government were involved in this process uh, of identifying the gaps and ways to move forward. The stakeholders group uh, was given a charge and was, again, to look at the, the state of the practice and identify areas where we can improve look for the, the gaps, the barriers, the opportunities, uh, really to look at um, how things have evolved, evolved, excuse me, uh, in, in various forms of delivering transportation solution over the over the decade or so since we initially instituted our, our standards. And then document them, prepare an implementation plan. And, and lastly, um, we were required through this legislation to report back uh, to the legislature, which we did uh, earlier this year, back this spring. We, get, we brought together uh, roughly 50 partners, excuse me, and, and we mentioned, uh, I mentioned earlier that those were not just our, our agency employees and they weren't just our designers, they were our maintenance folks and our planners and others. Uh, but we also brought together our external partners, and, and I think one of the things that, that made us unique is that we brought our external partners to the table on the ground floor. We wanted to make sure that we understood what their concerns were and what, what we may have been missing from their perspective early on in the process. In September 2004, we went through our gap analysis. Uh, we went through our, our standards. We had so, a series of workshops where we brought folks, both our internal group, our external group, and then we brought them together uh, to talk about what the gaps were and what folks felt were some of the issues and things that may have been missing or needed improvement uh, in our current state standards. One of the pieces um, that the M2D2 process brought to us um, specifically, and all of this obviously brought all of this to us, but one, one of the big benefits was the series of workshops. And it was very engaging in that um, Smart Growth brought, uh, and, and you can see here on this slide, experts from around the country to talk to us about things like land use and freight logistics and active transportation, multimodal. All of these things were held in a series of workshops, again, where we invited both our internal and external stakeholders to the table to, to listen first. Um, many of these were a day, uh, some were several days, where you know we listened, we learned, but then we talked about how we could, uh, how we could apply some of the, the things that we learned in those workshops to the Vermont context. That was very beneficial, and really, it was it was a unique experience where we, we were focused on these issues for a day, and it brought thoughts out both um, from our internal and external partners. Very beneficial. The outcome of the workshops um, is really was building off the gap analysis that we had done, and. We, so that we were identifying through that not only did we have, if you will, our preconceived notions of the gaps that may have existed in, in our state standards, but through the series of workshops that further refined that, uh, that list of gaps and those issues and opportunities we had to improve upon. And also it, it identified some of the barriers that we might have had uh, to, for deploying some of the practices uh, throughout our state. The product was a work plan. Uh, this work plan was very detailed, and it really, it really was, it is serving as the foundation as we move forward. Um, it looked at uh, not only what we needed to do to revise our existing Vermont state standards, but what other guidance documents did we have? It took a look at, you know, how we may integrate. Uh, you know, not only do we have the Vermont state standards that looked at a lot of geometric criteria, but we also had a bicycle and pedestrian manual and how we may start to integrate those types of things together and so that they weren't their own separate documents, but really uh, a living document that incorporated so many of the different modes and user groups that we had out on our network. It also talked about how we may be able to communicate that revision. It kind of laid out a path for us. And one of the key components was that it's, it started to lay out uh, some thoughts on how we would provide training when we got to that point of rolling out the revised uh, Vermont State Standards. 
this this slide here talks a little bit about um, where we were and how we developed the work plan. And, and again, it really was it, this was a building block process that started early on with with some uh, internal meetings with our management, to our internal stakeholders meetings, external the joint meetings, the gap analysis. It really was um, it, it was a, an effort that we had that was very focused on communicating with each other what the challenges were, seeking the feedback and input from our, our stakeholders, and then obviously pulling that together into a work plan that laid out a path for us to move forward. Just quickly, this, this here just shows uh, you know a little bit about uh, the summary that it had. One of the big pieces um, of the content of the chapter in, in our work plan was the summary and the next steps. We had some very detailed next steps. The appendices went even further into that. And it really laid out not just not just the what, but the how um, and who needed to be engaged as we move forward looking to uh, implement the revisions and take this to the next level. Specifically, there were some recommendations in the plan. Um, obviously, there's a lot more that I can show on, on a couple of slides. Uh, but a couple of things that really jumped out to us as, as we move forward. When one was uh, we were looking at, and, and I'm sure a lot of organizations have, um, we were looking at a lot of different documents that, that dealt with discrete topics and it, somehow finding a way to integrate those together um, so it really, it really captured the essence of what we were doing in, in practice across the network when we looked at the different modes and, and the different user groups. And so one of the things was to develop a user-friendly uh, interface online so that, th so that these documents could be integrated together, that we weren't creating a document was, that was 2,000 pages long that nobody would be able to use, but to develop a user-friendly interface that could be used not just by uh, engineers, technicians, and planners, but could, by, could be used by municipalities and, and many people throughout the state. A couple of the major modifications that were recommended uh, was to de to develop a decision making framework. So not just you know uh, hard and fast tables that said pick if you have this condition, this speed, this traffic volume, pick this number. But looking at it so that you had a, more of a framework and more of an understanding of how those those uh, issues were were arrived at, so that when you got to a point of needing to select a value, you had a range of values, and there was a decision making framework associated with that. Obviously, the context based uh, I mentioned it earlier, very important thing to us here in Vermont. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we looked at our roadway classifications and that we were not only looking at the traditional major arterials, minor arterials, and collectors, but that we were looking at things like transition zones that went into, that go into village settings um, so that it's, we all know that it's not a hard and fast. You're going from 50 miles an hour to 25 miles an hour. There's a transition in there. We wanted to make sure that we were looking at the, at the context in a little bit more depth than we had previously. That was a recommendation. And then um, one of the things that you know that we talked about was looking at uh, design vehicle um, considerations and guidance, so that we were looking at things, not looking at just okay, we need this for a truck turning radius, okay, and then we need this for a pedestrian, but looking at in this guidance how those things interact with one another, and making sure that it's not left to the designer to to kind of interpret that, but to make sure that that is something that concept is ingrained throughout the document. So you're not just making a decision on one specific uh, user or one specific design vehicle, but how those decisions impact one another. We also included the need. Uh, we didn't. We didn't have a lot of uh, Vermont-specific intersection design guidance or standards, and so that was something that that we're looking to beef up as we move forward. I mentioned the range of options. And then another important piece was looking at making sure we had a glossary of key terms and concepts so that when we spoke about, when we speak about uh, a certain term or we speak about wanting to make sure that we're, we're incorporating a certain theme uh, into our design standards, that we've defined that so that it's not left to the designer to interpret. We've, defi uh, uh, we've, we've been defined that for them such that uh, it's, it's basic and it's easy to understand. 
these next couple of slides before I finish just talk a little bit about where, where we were and some of the recommendations that came out of our work plan as part of this process. And, and this one here is just some detailed recommendations on how to engage various user groups in the process as we move forward. Uh, obviously, I won't go through this, but it lays out the framework and the expectations so that it's really clear as we move forward and everybody knows their part and their role. And then I mentioned earlier, um, it also lays out uh, training is absolutely one of the critical areas that we need to address as we get to as we move through this process. And this lays out a framework that that gets us to a point where we we can identify not only the resources that we need to develop the training, but then also what we felt would be the right level of investment at different user groups uh, to make sure that they understand the concepts that we put forth in, in the new documentation. A little bit more on training. Again, this one just talk, uh, just uh, demonstrates that we have the, uh, the commitment to make sure that we have some interactive online training as well. And, and then lastly, um, just talk a little bit about the benefits of M2D2. And, and one of the things I'm realizing as I'm going through my presentation, I, I should have mentioned up front, we, we've gotten through the work plan piece. Uh, we've gone through everything that I talked about today. Our next steps is to really implement the work plan. We're working on an RFP right now, uh, looking for some national uh, guidance, uh, or a national level expert on from the consulting community to come on board and work with us to take this to the next step and implement our work plan and actually the nuts and bolts of the revisions to our state standards. In summary, the benefits of the M2D2 process for us, uh, and, and I'm not going to read these word for word, but it really, um, the process brought about a focus and a fresh focus for us here in Vermont. It, it brought the national expertise, it brought the training, it brought the examples, and really what it brought about was the opportunity for us to not, we weren't, this wasn't something that we were doing within our organization. Um, this was something that we brought some external resources on board that both uh, our, our stakeholders internally and externally could relate to. There wasn't an us and them thing. It was, an, it was a group that was brought forward and a process brought forward that really took away that us and them piece. The range of topics, uh, I showed you a slide earlier on you know, where we were with uh, the various workshops. Uh, a huge range of topics and expertise was brought to us. The, the process, I mentioned it was transparent and open. And, and one of the things that this did as well, and this goes back to the legislation, uh, we had worked with Smart Growth even before we requested um, the legislature, or worked with our legislature for the language that they provided to us. But it made sure that we had that support uh, through all levels, and that was critical to the process we had. And, and I guess lastly, what this has done for us is it's provided that foundation uh, we're looking to, um, we, we changed the way we did business back in 1997, and this really is going to take us to a whole new level of how we do business and how we acknowledge the state of the practice of delivering highway uh, improvements and highway solutions on our network. And this really has provided us the foundation to move forward, and, and we're really excited on, on where we go from here. And I think with that, I'm done. Unmuted. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, it's really some interesting work that Vermont is doing. Um, and now we're going to change to Florida and hear about some of their work uh, to improve their bicycle and pedestrian safety in complete streets. So Billy, you should be able to click on the slide and then you can take it away. Very good. Uh, thank you, Robbie. Uh, good afternoon Muted. to all. Um, we, uh, our journey in many ways is very similar to the journey that uh, Kevin's agency has been on in Vermont. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got to where we did uh, in the Florida DOT and, uh, and where we're going um, without getting as much into the M2-D2 process. Uh, the problem that, that really came about um, was the Dangerous by Design report, which was put out by Smart Growth America. It identified our four regions listed here as the most dangerous place in, in the U.S. for pedestrians and bicyclists. And our previous secretary, when he announced that I was leading this statewide in, uh, effort, uh, said that this is not a place where we want to be number one. And so, uh, so this all began as a result of our safety problems in the state of Florida. 
And as we move through the process, uh, and there's uh, quite a bit of effort that uh, that came out of that uh, effort as it relates to the safety side, which I'm not going to go into as much detail, but we had already started making a lot of structural change as a result of the uh, NHTSA evaluation that was done in January of 2012, including changing um, uh, basically our organizational structure to provide specialists in the areas of bicycle and pedestrian. Uh, safety and also planning and design. Uh, and as we got that uh, moving forward, and, and you can find the information about our safety initiative on the link that's listed here on this particular slide, one of the things I shared with our leadership team is that uh, while all this focus on safety and our existing crash quarters was certainly critical to us solving the problem, I shared with them that we couldn't continue to design the same way we've been doing for the last 50 or 60 years and expect different results. So that began the process of moving in the direction of, of establishing uh, a complete streets policy, which uh, I have a policy team that I've been working with now for about two years. And as a result of our work there, we uh, adopted our complete streets policy in September of last year. And, and very much like Kevin's experience in Vermont, uh, we worked with Smart Growth America beginning in March of this year. Uh, to develop our implementation plan, but we'd actually already started, uh, begun implementing changes that we realized were necessary to accomplish complete streets. And so uh, promotion of modern roundabouts, uh, uh, we have a statewide guidance on road diets. Our, our promotion of broad, uh, modern roundabouts came out in the, in the way where we have basically said when you're uh, reconstructing or putting in a new intersection that you have to prove that modern roundabouts are not the proper tool uh, before you put in a signalized system. And so I'm going to move forward from here. Uh, we've also got to work on our culture change, including uh, the drivers and operators. And so we're working on changing the laws as part of that. Uh, because we'd already started uh, this effort before we actually adopted our complete streets policy, and, and with us being a, a FHWA focus state, we'd already started doing training. Uh, and the Designing for Pedestrian Safety course is really in line with the whole efforts related to complete streets. And so we've been educating our staff now for almost two years and local governments in, in the changes that need to be done from a design standpoint to improve safety for pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, like many of the Sunbelt states, uh, we, we in the transportation industry really were focused on moving cars. And part of the, our discussion, we've I've made over 140 presentations to local governments and, and uh, metropolitan planning organizations and professional organizations, basically helping them to understand that while we've had a big part in this problem, uh, as it relates to completing streets, we can't solve this problem by ourselves. We have to work with local governments to help us with land development regulations and improving the network of streets. You can see here uh, the top of half of the slide, most of our land development patterns are like this, where all the heavy lifting for transportation is done on the arterial system, contrary to what was done uh, before World War II, where you had a mix of uses and you had a network of streets. And so people may still choose to drive in this environment, but all the pressure is not putting uh, being put on a limited uh, network of streets. And so um, we have lots of evidence of that here in Florida. Uh, this happens to be just east of where I live in downtown Orlando, uh, where two homes that are only 70 feet apart from back door to back door require a seven mile drive to get from front door to front door. And so uh, if we're going to make our environment uh, safe, uh, convenient and comfortable for pedestrians and bicyclists. We have to have local governments working with us because in our state they control land development regulations and patterns. Uh, and that includes the setbacks. Uh, you may have a comfortable walking environment, but it's certainly not convenient when you have uh, all the buildings set back well from the street. And so these are the things that we're trying to help our local governments to understand. Likewise, our school boards. Uh, which are another challenge. And, and as those of us who've been dealing with this issue for some time know, speed is a big challenge as it relates to this problem. 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've already started implementing change uh, using Federal Highway's proven countermeasures, uh, the increased focus on modern roundabouts and road diets, uh, which also is supported by local governments to uh, improve economic development. And so here's just a before and after condition in Asheville, North Carolina. We have a lot of uh, modern roundabouts and road diets in play just as a result of our focus on this effort during the last three years. Uh, one of the big challenges we have with our rider, uh, wider corridors, uh, many of our corridors have uh, bi-directional turn lanes, and so we're increasing the use of mid-block crossings with high emphasis markings and use of the uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacon for four-lane roads and narrower, and then for six-lane roads, either a pedestrian hybrid beacon or a full-blown PED signal. Uh, we've seen a lot of success with these treatments in the city of St. Pete, who has uh, use them in a widespread fashion. Uh, one of the changes we're going to is having a target speed uh, instead of the conventional ASTO guidance where you're designing for as high a speed as practical because we want people to recognize through the built environment and through our street design what the desired speed should be for drivers to drive. We historically have not done a good job of sending that message to drivers. Uh, but the bigger challenge we have is many of our roads are four-lane roads. Uh, this is a street in, uh, in downtown Orlando, and uh, you can see there's four lanes. Uh, this is right next to Lake Eola, which is in the heart of downtown. And notice that the buildings are set back in a very suburban pattern, and despite the fact that these lanes, travel lanes, are only nine and a half feet, which is not showing up for some reason, uh, people do tend to speed down here. So as, as we have already begun the education process, even before we engaged uh, in the M2-D2 process, uh, we're trying to help our local governments and our engineers to understand that as they do redevelopment, uh, that we need more street network, uh, buildings at the street. Um, and we're using the transect zones uh, as our starting point for discussion in terms of defining the context. And, uh, and so we're our, historically, where we've talked about context, in terms of landscaping the edges in suburban and, and other locations. Uh, we're talking now about context in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in a way of what the built environment is and the relationship between the street and the built environment. So instead of doing a one-size-fits-all approach, we'll design the streets, the curb return radii, the travel lanes, and all the other elements of our street design in the urban environment very differently than in the suburbs. And so, again, once again, we've already started moving in that direction. Uh, we, we have a chapter in our Florida Green Book, which is used by local governments and a handbook uh, for traditional neighborhood development that, that contains a lot of what will similarly uh, be in our roadway design guide, which is currently called the Plans Preparation Manual. Uh, and it already uses this context-based approach to street design. So. As we've made these presentations, we're letting our engineers and local governments know that in the urban environment, you can go to this document and already get guidance on what we're talking about from a complete street standpoint. And then we use illustrations. Uh, this is a redevelopment uh, project in downtown Orlando or adjacent to downtown Orlando. It has 32 street connections uh, to the adjacent network, uh, which is mostly suburban, more conventional suburban sprawl. And there's no four-lane roads or signals within this uh, community because of the extensive network of streets. And so, once again, we're trying to tell the story for how things should be done differently in the built environment. Uh, and smaller projects can be handled the same way. Uh, this is about two blocks in Winter Park. And, and once again, trying to emphasize the importance of land development patterns, uh, neighborhood schools, neighborhood parks, putting all these elements into uh, the built environment to support the complete streets efforts. And just a couple of examples, we now have buffered bike lanes uh, depending on the location between six and seven feet wide, uh, and we're looking at using multi-use paths as well in addition to Shiro's um, in the low speed, low, uh, low volume environments. And just to fall, uh, finalize uh, the discussion here, uh, we're sharing with them some illustrations, both a rural condition and a more suburban condition where if we were to fix the street, uh, just fixing the street alone does not make it a complete street in terms of uh, as it relates to pedestrian comfort 
inconvenience. And so here's just one example that happens to be just south of Tallahassee. Uh, and you can see once you add the buildings at the back of sidewalk, it completely transforms how that corridor looks and feels. Uh, likewise, a project uh, uh, just south of uh, uh, Charleston, again, a very wide corridor, 200 feet, uh, taking those outside uh, travel lanes and making them basically the access for all the commercial along the edge. So to summarize, um, what I would say in, in terms of our experience Unmuted. Uh, in working with Smart Growth America on this project, and, and I give special thanks to Roger for his leadership, uh, there was just no way that we could have gotten to the place that we got to in the time frame, nor have as, as comprehensive uh, a document for our implementation plan. We, we have a complete streets website on our Florida DUT website and our implementation plan, our final implementation plan is on that website. Uh, we just had our kickoff meeting uh, this week with our consultant that's helping us with our uh, complete streets handbook and at the same time we will be rewriting all of our design and policy guidance. Uh, the various offices will be uh, rewriting those documents. Uh, simultaneously with the, with the production of this handbook, which we'll use for education uh, as we roll out our complete streets policy guidance uh, throughout the state of Florida. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Billy. I'm uh, excited to see the transformations uh, that are happening in Florida. That'll be great in a few years when, uh, when it is, starts to take effect. Um, Okay, so we have Roger Millar from Washington State DOT, and they're just starting the M2D2 process. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Roger, and if you just click on the slide, you should be able to change them. Muted. Unmuted. Hi, everybody. This is Roger Millar. Muted. Um, I am seeing if I, there we go. Um, I'm the Deputy Secretary of the Washington Department of Transportation. Good morning from the upper left-hand corner of the country. I uh, wanted to say thank you to, to Billy and to Kevin and to all the folks at their agencies for the, the great partnership that we had over the past couple of years. Uh, now I'm in a, a new role in another place and uh, we're doing some neat stuff uh, in Washington State. Um, we call what we're doing practical solutions. Uh, Washington State has a robust economy, a quite a varied uh, environment, and uh, quite a multimodal transportation system. Here at WashDOT, we obviously operate, uh, own and operate lots of highways and bridges. Uh, we also uh, operate the nation's largest uh, passenger ferry system. Uh, we operate uh, um, inner city rail. Uh, we support uh, public transportation, um, bicycle activity, pedestrian activity, the, the, the whole shebang. And in our community, in our state, uh, we're calling our effort practical solutions. And you know, you hear it called lots of stuff around the country, complete streets, practical design, practical solutions, um, uh, what have you. But here, here in Washington, it's practical solutions. We've come a long way uh, in Washington state and around the country. Uh, the interstate system's pretty much done. Um, um, our national design guidance is improving. Uh, safety is uh, was something that we've all been working on, and uh, here at Washington State DOT, uh, we're completing uh, the largest capital delivery program in our history. We've got some amazing stuff going on with, uh, you know, the Alaska Way Viaduct and the SR 520 floating bridge across Lake Washington, and, and, and other mega projects around the state. Uh, we're also very concerned with uh, the state of good repair of our system. We're seeing a, a lot of new ideas out there on the street. You know, when you think about what we do at a DOT, it takes, you know, 10, 20 years or more to take ideas and turn them into a reality on the ground. And when you look at what's happening in terms of trends in autonomous and connected vehicles and trends in active and public transportation, um, integrating transportation with land use, um, this whole shared economy with car sharing and bike sharing and you know, sharing this and sharing that. There's a lot of stuff that, that we need to think about as, as we think about making investments in our system and as we think about how um, our system is going to evolve while we're making those investments. 
So for us, you know, what are we going to do next? We've got uh, aging infrastructure. We've got more problems than we have money to fix. So we really need to be strategic about where we make investments, and, and that's where practical design comes in. It's a new approach for a, a new day. Um, we're transforming our approach. We're looking at, at, at tr practical transportation solutions, and our goal is not to spend less money necessarily, but to spend it smarter so that we can fix more problems on a system-wide basis. What we're doing, we're, we're supporting decisions uh, by our project teams and by our project teams working in partnership with the communities we serve that focus on the need for the project and eliminate the, you know, might as wells. And while we're there, why don't we, you know, we're, we're, we're really focused on need. We're moving uh, from the kind of standard-based cookie-cutter design to performance-based designs. Uh, we're empowering our staff to make decisions for the longest time. Our engineers were really constrained to just focus on, you know, do what the do what the table says to do. What we're doing is is giving them the freedom to to use engineering judgment and and, and be practical about it. Um, we're providing tools that support decision making, and we're supporting our staff with training and development. And you know, this M two D two program that Smart Growth America developed, it would be great if we could avail ourselves of it. Um, but uh, we're going to muddle through until such time as funding becomes available for something like M2D2. Um, we define practical solutions uh, in, in a way that's unique to our context. It's performance-based versus standards-based. We're focused on need and least cost solutions. We, we look at the system as a whole. Um, we really are emphasizing community engagement. We did some study of projects that we've done around uh, the state and found that when we engage the community up front in the project development process, we could save 30, 40 percent of the total project cost by just going into the community, finding out what the needs really are, and designing solutions that, that serve those needs versus the, the old way of doing business, kind of designing it uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a, a dark room away from the community, displaying it out there, and then defending the, uh, the bad decisions that we made. Uh, we're looking at an interdisciplinary approach and uh, collaborative decision making, and we're designing our projects based on the land use and transportation context which within they, they exist, and uh, developing strategies based on on data. So, you know, what practical solutions is and what it's not. We hear a lot of, of, of things about it. Um, it really is focused on the purpose and the need for the specific project. It really is designed to engage local stakeholders, but it doesn't compromise safety. Um, it's not a new tool. It's not a new method. Um, it doesn't uh, uh, usurp the environmental process. It really is, uh, like we've been saying in Complete Streets for the longest time, it really is a change in mindset, a change in paradigm about how you uh, develop and deliver projects. So we've been focused on a couple of areas that sound an awful M, a lot like M2D2. Uh, perhaps that's why I'm here. But uh, we are making some major changes to our design manual. Um, we are doing multimodal demand management, operational and off-system strategies first. Um, and uh, you know, instead of just leaping to that capital product that we have, um, we're making sure that we've explored everything else first. And we are making incremental solutions, uh, you know, possible out in communities as opposed to trying to solve all the world's problems at one time. We don't have the money to do that, so we can come in and make a, a, a quicker and less expensive fix in a community that's uh, much better than uh, pondering uh, the the perfect for 20 or 30 or more years and, and having nothing happen on the ground. Uh, the context is hugely important in roadway design. You know, you can be rural, you can be suburban, you can be urban. This is all the same highway. Very different places, though. So, you know, we're worried about context. We're worried about fixing more problems sooner. You know, here we had an interchange. The ramps were failing. Um, a high cost improvement going in and replacing an interchange that's tens of millions of dollars. Uh, putting a roundabout in, a couple hundred thousand, and we, we made that happen um, quicker, and uh, we made it happen uh, in a way that the community was more uh, accepting of, and we were able to do it 
uh, at a much lower cost than otherwise. So next steps for us, we're making huge changes to our design manual. Um, big changes were announced recently. There'll be more changes in 2016. We're really focusing on, um, on training for our staff. We're finding that when you empower staff and free them from those uh, design tables and the like, they, they, they've got to have the training to have the confidence to, to make informed decisions as, as planners and engineers. So we're really focused on practical solutions and project development process training. We're looking at multimodal design, um, implementing the highway safety manual, and then just because of, of funding and other constraints, uh, lease cost planning and, and multi-strategy cost estimating and the like. Those are going to come later. Results for us, um, we used our commitment to practical solutions as, as one of, uh, one of our, um, our innovations when we went to the state legislature and asked for a, a new funding package. Uh, the legislature uh, responded uh, with uh, $16 billion for new construction um, and actually incorporated practical solutions uh, into the state statute, which was great. Uh, we're looking to improve port access. We're looking to add capacity, multimodal capacity to the system. Uh, look at our east-west trade corridors, uh, both within the state and, and on the interstate uh, system, both highway and, and rail. We're looking to uh, improve the reliability of our, our ferry system. It's really an iconic part of, of transportation in Washington state. And uh, we're looking at uh, freight with trucks and trains, moving them safely and quickly through uh, grade crossings uh, because we quite often find uh, uh, product coming off of ships at our ports crosses uh, our north-south uh, transit and road connections. So in the future, um, we're reporting the savings we achieve through practical design. The legislature is allowing us to set those savings aside and uh, starting in 2024, once we've got some money in that fund, uh, those savings will be appropriated equally. Um, half of the money is going to go to preservation projects for state of good repair and the other uh, to a pot to fund new improvements uh, to the transportation system. Lessons learned, you, you really need to have political support for this. Um, the cookie cutter approach that we've taken to project design in the past is just completely obsolete. All the, all the cookie cutter stuff's been done. We need to be uh, a little more sophisticated in what we do. Uh, we're learning that collaboration improves quality, that small fixes can make big differences, and that uh, learning together and sharing uh, the solutions and building trust is really key to success in the transportation environment. So with that, uh, some resources that might be of interest to the folks here on the, uh, the webinar. Unmuted. Thank you very much. Ready for questions. Thank you very much, Roger. Um, I just am so excited to hear three different, really different um, reasons for using this process and what three different states are doing, but all trying to achieve a more multimodal um, future for the state and three very different types of states as well. Um, I think this is a really good uh, example of, of how this can be used in different areas. So I do want to remind people that you can type questions into the chat box if you have questions and then we will be taking questions. Um, we're doing fairly well on time. So we have uh, about 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes for questions if people have them. Uh, if you don't see the chat box, just click on the little orange arrow on the top right of your screen and you should be able to see the chat box and that can be typed in. Um, so to start it off, I'm just going to say um, that I'm sort of curious, Billy, um, you talked a lot about needing the help of local communities and to make their land use work so that all the traffic doesn't doesn't end up on the arterials and the burden of that. How is that working out? How what kind of reaction are you getting from communities in uh, in your request to have a more connected road system? Sure. Uh, by and large, the, the communities, and, and I guess this is what, not unlike a lot of things, the communities that have asked us to come in and speak are usually have some interest in moving in that direction. Uh, the difference, the, the big 
dividing line, I would say, is between cities and counties. The cities tend to get this more so than, than do our counties uh, across the state. We have 67 counties, about 500 cities. Um, and so those who are trying to um, who are trying to improve things for their citizens, especially as it relates to walkability uh, in, in terms of comfort and convenience, uh, they are very receptive to this. The, the big challenge uh, with many of them is getting the land developers who sometimes have a lot of political uh, horsepower to get on board with, uh, with those regulation, with changing regulations to design uh, communities differently. Okay. So some areas are excited about it and, and some are, are a little less so perhaps. Um, Just like our engineers. Yeah, of course. Um, so we do have someone who asked, how much does it cost each state for this M2D2 process? Um, either Roger or Beth could probably answer that. Yeah, sorry about that. I was trying to get off mute. Uh, it, it can vary, but generally, uh, this is something we like to work out with the state, talk about um, uh, the, the various approaches, and it, it, it ends up being probably around $250,000 for the whole session. Okay, great. And we work with local philanthropy to also help support that. Okay. Yeah, it was, uh, it was really interesting when uh, we originally developed the program at Smart Growth America, there was uh, you know grant funding from a national foundation. Uh, that funding has gone away. Um, here in Washington State, uh, we're essentially self-funding this, but again, you know, going to the legislature and, and convincing them of the, uh, the, the, the practical on the ground, uh, day in, day out uh, savings to uh, the citizens of Washington over, uh, over time of implementing these approaches. Uh, you know, practical solutions is going to more than pay for itself. But, you know, making that case is huge, and uh, it, it's something that, you know, other states around the country, I, I'm hoping that the, the work in Michigan and in Vermont and in, in Florida uh, can stand as a, as a model, and it'll be easier for uh, DOT officials who, who want to take uh, uh, initiatives like this to, to get them through their, uh, their, their funding, uh, their funders, and uh, get the, the product out to the citizens they serve. Okay. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it is something that pays off in the long run, but sometimes it's hard to convince people that it's a, a, a good investment right now. Um, but certainly it, it is a cost savings in the long run. Well, I'd, I'd say sometimes it even pays off in the short run. Uh, you know, if we've worked with the state of Tennessee uh, on uh, finding ways to bring down the cost of various projects, and they've seen, you know, $40 million projects turn into $300,000 projects. So sometimes by just focusing in on the sort of project you're developing and bringing the cost down immediately, you can have very immediate cost savings that overwhelms the cost of the reform. Good point. Um, and then we, we do have a question, I guess, in sort of uh, general culture. Uh, could you address the process for building capacity for innovative design by planners and engineers, particularly in terms of changing institutional culture about how we do things and the how we do things is in quotes. So how do you, how do you uh, talk to um, the existing planners and engineers about, about changing how they think about these things? Well, I definitely like some of, uh, of the folks who've been through the process and who are running uh, operations at DOTs to speak to that. But I would say, that uh, a lot of folks already recognize, you can tell in the conversations about individual projects, that folks already recognize that what we're doing is not working the way they intend for it to work. They've done a lot of the same projects for years and years and they're not getting the outcomes they expect. They feel like they're going back to the well for the same thing over and over. So there's an openness to the fact that things might be different. What's interesting is when you go through an M2D2-like process, you find out that a lot of your barriers aren't what you think they are. They are the very call to projects lead you in the wrong directions. Your scoping process kicks out a lot of the considerations you want. You didn't mean for it to kick out the processes you want. We like to ascribe a lot of the problem to culture, but we don't recognize 
where in the project development process we are incentivizing people having a single mode approach as it is. And so a lot of what M2D2 does is it looks at the structure and the incentives that are in place to do things as we do them today and really takes away a lot of the, uh, the creative opportunity and the engineering that our engineers should be allowed to do. I can, this this is Billy. I could speak to that from Florida standpoint. Our, if you were to look at our design manuals, they're overly prescriptive, and, and it has really been a one-size-fits-all. And even though we've told them for years that they have flexibility to do things differently, um, it's, that culture has been, in, has been ingrained in, in both our, our, our DOT employees and our consultants, which do about 90% of our production. And so the, the, the way we've driven the tra change, I would say, is two things. The local governments have been putting pressure on us to change over time, especially the more sophisticated communities. Uh, and then having the secretary at the very top say, we are going to do things differently, and so you can expect the change to come, and, and, uh, and then having that support to drive policy change, in our case, from the district, uh, has been what's helped us to get there. Yeah, to, to add to that, this is Roger. It's, 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 you, know, you never want to miss the opportunity to take advantage of a crisis when it presents itself. And, you know what we had in Washington State was a was a funding problem. We didn't we we do not have the money uh, to maintain what we have in a state of good repair and to operate it efficiently. And uh, we needed to develop the trust of of our elected officials to make the hard decisions about coming up with a package of funding uh, to to support our program. And so. Um, you know, practical solutions, uh, the approach was part of what we used to show people that their, their money would be um, well spent. And so I, I think it's a part of it is uh, leadership from uh, the secretary. Um, secretary Peterson here in Washington State has done a, a marvelous job, but we've, we've brought our state legislature on board, our, our, our Senate and, and House Transportation Committees get this, our governor gets this, and uh, the folks in the agency, the young engineers and planners that are, that are driving change, uh, see that, uh, that all the way up the, the, the chain, uh, they've, they've got support for what they're doing. So institutionalizing this, making it stick over time, is, is going to be a heavy lift, uh, but we, we've got the momentum and uh, we're, we're showing some results. And, I think places like uh, like Vermont and Florida and Michigan and hopefully here in Washington State are, are setting an example that other states around the country might want to follow. Okay. And if I if if we have a moment, this is Kevin to to add just a little bit to that. Is is um, Billy was talking about how Florida's the standards were prescriptive. Uh, I mentioned earlier in my presentation, ours have been flexible since uh, 1997. So we're not, we're actually not looking at changing the culture of, of uh, flexibility. We're looking to redefine what that flexibility means, and and it's it's ingrained in our culture right now. But the the world has changed around us, and what we're trying to do is make sure that we can focus people on the things that are important and provide them the tools they need, rather than just a flexible set of design standards. Really providing them the tools they need to to make more informed decisions and better decisions as as they're looking at how they're going to implement the solutions on the network. Okay, uh, we do have one. Um, someone chimed in about a quote. Um, uh, something that Billy had said. Uh, it said, regarding Mr. Hadway's quote from AASHTO on design speed, the current AASHTO Green Book recommends design speeds of 30 to 60 miles per hour for urban arterials, 30 miles per hour or higher for urban collectors, and 20 uh, to 30 for local urban streets, all of which depend on a variety of factors, uh, such as terrain, pedestrian presence, development, et cetera. The highest possible design speed quote is inaccurate. Um, so I just wanted to get that in there because I think somebody took uh, felt that they were not being portrayed yeah, the, correctly. <laughs> yeah, the language the language that's in my quote was actually taken out of out of the previous version of Ashto, and it was still in our uh, design guides. Okay, so it was something on the state state um, level that was still left over. Correct, but that language was in ASTO for a very, very long time. Okay, 
Well, and I think people need to understand that, you know, the way that the process works is ASHTO may update things, but it takes years for that to work its way through the state design guides. Mm -hmm. And so it is great that the ASHTO is modernizing, but that doesn't fix the problem alone. And, And a lot of times these states have a lot of other procedures and rules and, and guidances and systems in their state that are built off of those old, those old rules. And so it doesn't just transform because ASHTO updates their guide. Okay. Guess, yeah. Correct. yeah, this is Roger. It's, it's a lot like in the land use world where you develop a beautiful plan for a community, but you don't go in and change the rules. Um, you have this vision, and it's, 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 you know, a lot of times we find it's illegal to do a lot of the things that, that you know, the new urbanists want to do, to do a lot of the things to create wonderful, walkable communities based on our old rules. It's, that's the problem. So when we do something like adopt a complete streets policy, it's a beginning, but you've got to go through what Florida went through to get the, and is going through, to get the rules in place to make that policy happen. It's, it's, it's the heavy lift but it's the important thing that decision makers need to know. You know, you can't just go in and adopt a policy and think you're going to solve the world's problems. You've got to go in and, and change the, the rules that uh, make it happen on the ground. Great. Well, I don't see any additional questions. Uh, if anybody has any, you can go ahead and still type them in. And in the meantime, I want to uh, heartily thank all of our presenters. I thought this was an extremely interesting presentation uh, to hear from different states about what they're doing. And I just wanted to remind people that we will have a, uh, co- a recording of this webinar up on the SSTI website probably tomorrow, possibly today. Um, And if you would like to find out about future SSTI webinars, you can subscribe to our newsletter and you can follow us on Twitter. And um, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions. So thank you to everyone for uh, signing on and thank you to our presenters very much for the presentation today.